welcome to a brand new edition of Backstage 360. Well, would you ever think that ballet would be the world of espionage, spies, cloak and dagger, including an assailant throwing acid in the face of the Bolshoi director? Well, it's all true and part and parcel in this book, Bolshoi Confidential. I'll have a sit-down chat with the author himself, Simon Morrison. But right now, we had a blast at Interstellar Rodeo this past summer. Let's meet one of the fascinating musicians of 2016. Stop this race, begin it now. Fate lies beyond the clouds. We'll never turn me back. Interstellar Rodeo 2016, it's all about great music, but sometimes behind the artist is an incredible story. Here is Fantastic Negrito. I grew up in Oakland, California, which is a pretty rough city, and I was always a strange kid in the hood. Um, I would walk through the hood like wearing leopard skin cowboy boots and like bright orange pants, and so I was always an exhibitionist before I was a musician because I was from a family of 14 kids, and I was in the middle, so I didn't really get that attention, so I took it out on society. I kind of looked up Prince because he was a little bit off the way that I was and I learned that he taught himself how to play instruments so I thought I'll do what he did because he seemed like we seemed like we were on the same frequency. So I learned how to play instruments instead of uh, guns. I did find some success in L.A. as far as uh, monetary success early on as a youngster. I signed a big deal with a record label, but it just didn't work out. And uh, got into an accident that left me in a coma for three weeks. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me because then I got my mind right. But I did mangle my playing hand, which I renamed the claw. But that made me a better player because I can't play as much, so whatever I played, I played with everything that I had. I returned as Fantastic Negrita in my 40s. So it just goes to show you, there's no time limit on it. If you're coming from the heart and come real and give it all up to people and contribute to humanity, then it's a damn good thing. I would never consider ballet along the same lines as spies, intrigue, politics, and all things cloak and dagger, but Bolshoi Confidential, the name says it all, Simon, reading the first page, um, an assailant throwing acid in the artistic director's face, I, it's, I was like, I had to read it twice, I said, what is this? But you have brought to light this amazing story of the Bolshoi in all its grandeur, but you kind of peeled it away like an onion to expose so many different layers. Congratulations. Thanks but, very much. Um, why? Why do this book? Um, well, actually, I wanted to continue my education. Primarily, mm -hmm. I've always loved ballet. Um, 
I grew up uh, outside of Winnipeg and grew up at the doorstep of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and it was for me a kind of narcotic and I didn't understand it at all and had no aptitude for dance even though when I grew older I did some dance classes just to learn some of the vocabulary. Um, but for many years um, as a teacher of music history at Princeton I've mm -hmm. been doing archival work in Russia and I was there in and around the time that this terrible incident occurred and I wanted to understand what had happened and there was a huge media frenzy in, in Russia on mm -hmm. television and print media and on the internet um, that actually fueled a lot of the discussion the frenzy outside of Russia um, and it was a huge tabloidy gossipy horrible scandal involving a lot of people behaving badly and um, I was fascinated by the fact that this incredible institution and what I consider to be the greatest theater in the world and the greatest ballet company in the world was being rocked by this particular incident. And I wondered whether or not it had um, any real explanation in the structure of the place or politics and whether or not something like this had happened in the past. So uh, because I'm an archival grub, a rat, <laughs> I, I, I started to explore um, the history of the place and um, I touch on this, this incident mm -hmm. just as a kind of hook to draw people in, but really I was fascinated by how the theater was built and how the Bolshoi Ballet became the institution it is, and um, how ballet works and what makes ballet great and the kind of pressures that allowed uh, these great works like Swan Lake to be created there. Well, it certainly gave me an insight, uh, being a former dancer with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Yes, in one sense, I can relate to <laughs> all the hard work. Uh, and I have to admit, as a dancer, you have real tunnel vision. All you see is the theater, rehearsal, and bed, and then the cycle yeah, continues yeah. again. You don't realize all the maneuvers and minutia that are happening behind the scenes. And learning the history on where what I did for so many years was really fascinating and to think that the Bolshoi is ranked so high in the hearts of their citizens it was really again almost I was awestruck on how much power they had and when you think we're just entertainers we're just no, no. you weren't just entertainers because yeah. um, Bolshoi dancers dancers everywhere you are when well, this is the, the project of the book is like, yeah. what are you exactly and for the great dancers of the past in the mm -hmm. 19th century in Russia, they were freedom. Um, mm -hmm. What those girls, what those boys, you know, what those women, what those men could do was they represented a kind of freedom that was not allowed elsewhere in society. Mm -hmm. They were divine. And at a certain point, the power of their bodies, which communicated in a way that words do not, the kinetic power, uh, was something that um, people took advantage of. Uh, politicians, yes. and people with nationalist agendas. And so, although it's um, you know it's a really precious space, uh, a place where uh, people are you know shut away from the rest of the world, and mm -hmm. happily so, I think, uh, know very little else about what is going on. This art has this kind of power that you know people don't respect, I don't think, and give it enough credit for. Uh, I think it is like music, dance is the, able to com communicate things that are beyond words, and that becomes a really really potent tool when you're actually taking. Uh, ballets and actually associating them with ideological agendas and political agendas. And dancers like the great um, just deceased uh, Maya Plasetska, yes. she, um, that stage for her was not only freedom, um, it, was, it was safety and home, and it was a place where she really embodied a superhuman ideal um, for, for many decades. And um, how she, on one hand, defied mm -hmm. politics and on the one hand was part of politics is a fascinating story and it's just one of many about how what you're very much saying like mm -hmm. what you do and the power of your bodies and how they communicate has been marshaled in different ways throughout time uh, that's mm -hmm. really the story of this book how do you feel on dance today dancers today obviously it's different it's you know advancements and i guess too what is a dancer today as compared to those dancers in the past well, there's less, even at the Bolshoi, I think it's less of a national institution mm -hmm. than international. And so you get now this real cosmopolitan range of performers who, you know, like Diana Fishnova, one of the greatest dancers in the world, Olga Smirnova, up-and-coming mm -hmm. great romantic dancer. Um, they are effortlessly international. And I think the training um, is less um, specific, mm -hmm. um, uh, insular than it used to be. 
Although when I when I researched this book, I was fascinated to learn that you know until Tsar Alexander III took power and decided <laughs> that he wanted Russian art to be proud of, you know, it was French and Italian that I combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and the Italians dominated more in Moscow yes. than the French style because it was more virtuosic and acrobatic and mm -hmm. so forth. And that really took hold. And then in the Soviet period, that was enhanced. But I was fascinated to learn that great dancers of the early 20th century were actually trained in multiple traditions, you know, including character dancing, yes, which yeah. was kind of cut away. Mm -hmm. And so it was international in, in a way, but now we have on one hand um, an art, like all serious artists, struggles to survive in the marketplace. And so, uh, which is to some degree a good thing because I think now um, ballet companies are reinvesting in storytelling. Yes. Um, and the Bolshoi uh, tradition is one of great storytelling in dance, mm -hmm. plots, narratives and not abstraction, uh, which took over with Balanchine in New York City. And so we have that reinscribed, and uh, we have great story ballets now. And I think on one hand, the art um, um, will always be great. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bolshoi is eternal. Uh, it's one of two great theaters in you know, a very big country with an enormous amount of indigenous talent. And, um, but I'm, I actually find it really exciting right now, the turn to narrative ballet, the work that Alexei Ratmansky is doing in yes. New York, and he passed mm -hmm. through Winnipeg, um, as somebody who is reimagining ballets that had a tough time with the censors and giving them new life, breathing new life into them, and has now become really a superstar, sought-after choreographer like we haven't had in many decades. Yeah. So, and he, you know, is, I think, you know, people for a while actually thought, oh, ballet is dead, you know, it's not going anywhere, and here we have this, <laughs> this international figure who's who's really you know, imagining an alternate past for and works maybe, that were censored. Yeah, and, and maybe we need that now, Simon. Um, it's always been like ballet is only for the certain few and it's like an upper class kind of thing. And you know, I, especially with the Roman Pig Ballet in the years of Arnold Spohr, we tried to really make ballet accessible to all and, and do different things with it. And I don't know, it's just like, I guess, um, there was something about our company that made dance tangible. The Bolshoi, when we put them on such a high pedestal, even as dancers, it's like you're, you're in awe. But I think in this book, though, you really see the different personalities. And I really thank you to bring those personalities out that, yes, these are people. Yes, they did right and wrong things. But at the end of the day, it was they dance. Were great. They were great. Yeah, miraculous. So yes. it's a, there's a tragic element to it, but a tragic yes. gloriousness to it yeah. as well. And one thing that I think I tried to do in this book is because I wanted to know what dance meant. Mm -hmm. um, did you find it? I did. It means different things depending on the time you're looking at. But one thing that I wanted to uh, sort of get across was that it's not inaccessible. It's not an elite entertainment for the privileged few. Mm -hmm. um, it's not simply pastel angels that you go in, and, and it's not also something that you know in antiquity was just meant to titillate, you mm -hmm. know, the sort yes. of bare calves and <laughs> ankles and so forth. It actually um, is something that, because it's it's you know developed in different ways as a kind of vaudevillian tradition, real crowd crowd pleasing tradition associated works like Don Quixote even the early Swan Lake, mm -hmm. um, that actually showed these works were very much geared to local sensibilities and to communicate and communicating about social things. You know, one of the great questions in dance history is like, what does the dance of the sugar plum fairy mean? You know? <laughs> and it's like, when she performs, mm -hmm. it's like, is there sweetness in that? Is there sugar plumminess? Is it, what is a sugar plum? You know? And then you find mm -hmm. out that actually she's moving in a way that suggests she's a kind of you know, ideal hostess. This mm -hmm. has been written about by dance historian Sama Cohen. <laughs> and that, that basic idea of these gestures have you know, a kind of court pedigree and communicate different emotions and psychological mm -hmm. things, I really wanted to find out historically where those things come from within the Russian tradition. Well, we thank you, all the dance aficionados out there. And I don't really think that you really need to be a ballet lover, because after reading this, you will want to go see a ballet. Trust me. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much. After the break, it's another edition of Snack in a Movie, this time on location with filmmaker Brad Leach and Reserve 107.